Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this episode of In Conversation. Uh, it's my great pleasure um, to be talking with uh, Vikram Patel. Um, Vikram is the Pershing Square Professor of Global Health in the Blavatnik Institute's Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. His work has focused on the burden of mental health problems across the life course, their association with social disadvantage, and the use of community resources for their prevention and treatment. He is a co-founder of the Movement for Global Mental Health, the Center for Global Mental Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and the Mental Health Innovations Network, and Sangas, an Indian NGO which won the WHO Public Health Champion of India Prize. He has served on the committee which drafted India's first national mental health policy and the WHO High Level Independent Commission for Non-Communicable Diseases. So Vikram, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. Um, that phrase global mental health sounds like hubris almost. It is, you know, vague and huge but at the same time, no one would doubt its importance. Um, I also, picking up on what I said about what you've been focusing on, um, I know you have a program which you label Empower, and a lot of your work is about empowering people in low resource settings. So I wonder if you could just illuminate you know, what global mental health means, whether it's almost synonymous with empowering people in low resource settings. Over to you. Thank you, Philip. First of all, thank you for inviting me to be to have this conversation with you. Um, so global mental health, the way it's been conceptualized is that it is essentially a discipline of global health. And so what does global mental health do? It seeks to address the same goals of global health, but with a particular focus on mental health. Um, global health, as I understand it, is the field that is concerned with reducing disparities in the experience of good health outcomes, both within populations and between populations. Um, much of global health is focused on between populations. Um, and of course, the gaps are greatest in terms of inequalities and health outcomes between wealthy countries and less uh, resource countries. But in fact, in global mental health, one could argue that there are huge disparities not only between countries, but also within countries. So certainly the country that I join you from right now, the US, uh, there are vast disparities, both in the uh, incidence rates of mental health problems, but also their prevalence and chronicity um, within this country. And so it turns out that global mental health, perhaps unlike most other global health specialty areas, is relevant to every country in the world. Now, empowering people to be actively engaged uh, in prevention and care, of course, has been a central theme of my own work. But I will say there are many other activities and tasks that one could uh, uh, undertake in order to achieve uh, equity, uh, uh, reduce the disparities in mental health, and we can speak about that too. So, so tell me more about um, the social context of these things, whether, whether we're talking about family support or community support or government uh, or city level support. I mean, those different levels of, of support which are not to do with medication necessarily that you know they can be due to just enhancing connectedness i'm i'm very interested in that sort of diversity of approach within particular contexts of uh, if you like um inequity so philip if one looks at the history of the fields of mental health and you know there are a number of disciplines here but i'm going to just call it the mental health science disciplines um if you look at the history of the mental health science disciplines, um, you will find a very rich vein of evidence around interventions that are the, either targeted at individual's social environment, to take a very simple example, income security or housing, uh, or their psychological environment. Of course, that's a, the, we're talking about an inner environment. This is really around cognitive capabilities, for example. There is a very rich vein of evidence in support of interventions targeting both of these, both in the space of prevention, but also in, in the space of treatment and recovery. What's ironic, though, is that what most people receive when they are struggling with their mental health is a very narrowly defined biomedical intervention, typically delivered by a highly specialized provider 
and increasingly so dominated by pharmacology. That is not to say that pharmacology doesn't have a role, but it doesn't have the kind of singular dominant role that is currently visible in the way mental health care is organized and delivered in the world today. And what my work has sought to do is to really refurbish and replenish the opportunities for individuals and populations to receive evidence-based psychological and social interventions, both towards the goal of prevention and care. And of course, this means upending some of the power imbalances that are inherent in the system right now by, for example, allocating more resources to empowering non-specialized frontline workers and communities more generally towards the goals of mental health. Could you give some, uh, as it were, specific examples of that in action in your work? I mean, you've worked in Goa uh, for a long time and you're in Boston. And we've talked in the past about uh, the disparities in Boston and your interest in that. So, you know, there's two very different environments, but yet you're, as I understand it, applying, you know, similar sorts of mentality to, to those problems. And I think it'd be really helpful for people to understand what that actually looks like. So as a general rule, uh, I, I tend to sort of be guided by principles um, in all my work. And those principles are first and foremost, the principles of scalability that there is no point developing an intervention that is fundamentally not scalable and then trying to figure out how do we scale it up. And this has been the history of much of the work in psychosocial interventions. Um, so you've got to start by asking the question, what is scalable and then how can we make this effective? And typically that means deploying resources that are widely available for the delivery of these interventions. Uh, I'll give you a couple of concrete examples in a moment. The second is I'm a profound believer in science in terms of the mechanisms. I, I, I do not, um, I'm not comfortable with black box interventions, you know, interventions that have many things going on. So no one really knows what in fact is making any impact, if any. And if the intervention fails, is it because there was too much in it uh, that diluted the effect of what could have been a very effective intervention? So I'm very deeply influenced by the notion that we must target hypothesized mechanisms that are associated with the emergence of mental health problems or their maintenance. Two quick examples of how that looks in reality. The first is the case of prevention. There is a rich body of evidence suggesting that the social environment that children and young people face in schools is profoundly influential on their mental health and the emergence of mental health problems. So we design an intervention that specifically targeted what we call school climate. Uh, and we then deploy peer support workers, both old, you know, young people from the neighboring communities who entered the school, who were previously graduates of the school, to deliver the intervention, and then ran a randomized control trial demonstrating that this intervention led to dramatic reductions in both the experience of poor mental health, but also a very important uh, independent factor, but also a mediator of poor mental health, which was interpersonal violence in the schools. A second example in the treatment space is we know that um, depression is associated with social withdrawal. And there is a well-described psychological mechanism that is essentially suggesting that as you face stress in your daily life, which all of us do, when you withdraw from the social environment, this actually perpetuates a vicious cycle of withdrawal that leads to then lower mood and, of course, avoidance of the very factors that you need to engage with in order to get on with your life. And so a psychological treatment that targets social withdrawal called behavioral activation very strong evidence around it. We design an intervention built around that mechanism, but again, designed it in a way that could be delivered in real world settings by non-specialized providers. Typically that meant shortening the number of sessions and making it simpler and found pretty impressive effect sizes. And that's been replicated again and again. And, and today what we're now doing is scaling up these kinds of interventions by using digital tools to be able to rapidly train frontline workers to learn, master, and deliver those interventions. That's my program called Empower, and we're currently deploying this in the US and in India. So um, do you see a, a, a straightforward path? This is almost a ridiculous question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Do you see a straightforward path to further scaling up by the support from the health systems that you need support from? Or for that matter, if you're talking about schools, the educational systems, how, how do you actually build it into a much more widespread uh, implementation? 
I've, I've never been more optimistic. Let me say that first. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think it's a straightforward path. Obviously, that was a rhetorical question. Um, you know, it's a bumpy path, but at least I can see that path ahead. I can see light very clearly now at the end of the tunnel. And I should say that this was not the case even 15 years ago. And so it's important to reflect why is there today such political will? Political will both at the level of national governments like the U.S., the world's most well-resourced country when it comes to mental health, as well as, of course, not surprisingly, in all low-resourced countries, but also at the level of, um, you know, multilateral agencies like WHO and the World Bank. Why is it that all of these uh, groups are embracing the notion that to address the crisis of mental health, we're going to need to empower people in the community in prevention and care? So there's a real sense that any kind of pushback you might get from the political masters uh, is actually vanished. It's the opposite. There's a huge demand. There's also less and less pushback from professional communities, you know, the guilds of psychiatrists and psychologists. In fact, in the U.S. right now, both the major guilds are openly and actively embracing the need to rebalance the workforce, to build the workforce is the new mantra in, in, in different parts of the world. What we now need to see is resources to follow that mantra. I think it is happening. I think there is a rebalancing happening. But remember, unless you increase the overall uh, amount of money, it will really translate into taking money uh, from A to pay B. And of course, if A has historically had all the resources, they're going to resist that. So we do need to argue for new and additional money and that new additional money needs to now be channeled almost entirely to building the community-based workforce to translate the science that I described that has emerged in the last 15 years. By the way, I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't say much about the science. I, just to remind your, your listeners, the reason why there has been this transformation in political will is because of the science. 15 years ago, we didn't have any science that brief interventions delivered by frontline workers were effective for prevention and care. Today, that science is so substantial that I don't even think it's interesting to ask that question anymore. What's really interesting is really how do you translate that science into practice? And that's the goal that every different stakeholder in society concerned with mental health needs to embrace. So um, I'm wondering what is changing the stress landscape, if you like, that, that triggers uh, mental ill health um, and an obvious answer, and you know, you and I have talked about it before, um, is something I've long been interested in, which is the climate change impacts on mental health and well-being. But mental health, ill health, uh, is, is, is what we should focus on here, I think. Um, and, you know, people, that there is a movement in the academic community all over the place, realizing that this is something that needs to be really conceptualized in much more detail. Um, but there is a sort of question whether that is something that is just another thing to be thrown into the mix, or whether climate change is uh, in, in the combination of the disasters or eco-anxiety or whichever way you want to picture it, fundamentally going to change the way you have to think about your work, for example. Well, absolutely. I mean, I think climate change certainly is going to affect us in myriad ways. And it's not at all surprising it's going to affect our mental health because of the very deep interconnections uh, of our mental health with our social environment and, of course, our physical health. And so, in as much that there are going to be both direct and indirect effects of climate change-related events and changes uh, in our in our social worlds, um, it's going to affect our mental health in negative ways. And of course, your, the word eco-anxiety is not even about the direct and indirect effects. It's actually about the anticipated uh, 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 effects of climate change on the future. And this particularly affects young people who inherit the world that people like us have trashed. Uh, and so for them, there's also a, 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 de a degree of anger. I see this in my son, for example, who you know used to berate me uh, for all the amount of air travel that I used to uh, uh, do, uh, saying, you know, you, you know, you're contributing to the trashing of the world that I will inherit from you. So I, I do see this as a very important issue. But Philip, I, I would say that the current crisis that we're seeing in certain countries, especially uh, because the documentation isn't so good in all countries, so just the countries that do document longitudinal trends, we're seeing a really worrying trend of the worsening of mental health uh, indicators, particularly for young people. And this really demands 
not just a climate change explanation. Climate change is still fairly abstract, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, in, in, a, in a kind of an epidemiological sense. I do think there are many other more immediate determinants that are, are, are raising the head that we should pay attention to. The first is, of course, income insecurity. Uh, you know, the generation growing up today will be growing up in many parts of the world in, a, in, a, in, a, in an employment landscape that is far more insecure than their grandparents' generation. Uh, gone are the, 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 the guarantees that after you completed higher education, you would have a secure job for life. That's, that's, that's actually now a rarity for most young people. And insecurity of, of income, insecurity of employment has profound effects on one's, uh, uh, on, on one's mental health. We, we have to acknowledge that. The second is inequality. Uh, you know, inequality is, is ripping apart the, the core fabric of social connectedness. And, you know, there's a lot of literature about yeah. the importance of social connectedness. You know, the whole literature of loneliness. So we, what is it about? It's basically about the fact that people are not connected. And we comfortably accept that lonely people are more likely to suffer mental and physical health problems. But we don't fully accept that the mechanism that produces loneliness is actually affecting a lot more people as well. And the third, and this is speculative, um, which I am increasingly concerned about, is the effect of social media, particularly on the developing brain in very young teens. And by this, I mean teenagers um, in around the pubertal age. Um, there is a very growing body of, of course, only observational evidence. You're never going to get randomized control trial evidence, clearly indicating that young teens are far more likely to experience poor mental health in their later teens if they were using social media, uh, uh, you know, when they were 12, 13, 14 years old. And I do think there's a plausible biological explanation for this, a developmental explanation for this. And I, I do think that this is one of the key factors driving the youth mental health crisis in countries where young teens have high levels of access to the smart uh, to, to smartphones and social media. I remember attending uh, a session, actually I was chairing this discussion uh, at Davos, uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, where you have these very high-powered audience, uh, but feeling not very high-powered at all because they were parents. And the topic was exactly what you've been talking about. What do parents do in response to their, their, their kids' use of social media? And I mean, I don't know to what extent that is a research question actively at the moment. It's obviously everyone experiences it. Um, so and, and you're a parent yourself, evidently, and I don't know how this plays into your family and how you think about it. It certainly does to mine, but we don't have easy answers. Well, you know, we my, my son grew up with us in India, and back then, you know, kids below the age of 16 or 17 didn't have smartphones. So I, I, I do think what parents can do is actually themselves make sure that kids don't have smartphones. The only way you can access social media 24-7 is on a mobile device. But I actually think this is a responsibility that governments have. I, I wouldn't want to push this on our parents, yep. you know. I would say it's res it, the responsibility, because you know, the smartphone is very useful. It, it's not only used for social media. Social media. The internet is a very powerful medium, you know, for example, for looking for information. So I, I don't think that the right solution here would be the kind of solution we have with the tobacco industry strict controls that are enforced on how young people are able to sign up for social media accounts. Indeed, Philip, it'll interest you to know that certain states in the U.S. are already passing legislation that requires not just the young person to declare their when they sign up for an account, but verifiable proof that that person is of a certain age right. and then having clear restrictions that if you don't like a drinking age restriction, you cannot open an account yep. unless you have crossed a certain age. Yeah. Um, uh, it's time to come towards an end and I hope to, I hope to end on an upbeat note, uh, given that this topic is quite daunting. Um, do you see amongst the young people coming into the medical profession an increased desire than there has been in the past, partly to the, to, due to the stigma that I think you, you sort of touched on very briefly before, of, of wanting to get involved with mental health and mental ill health and to tackle it. So whether it's as psychiatrists or community or, or whatever, but a growth of young pe younger people building the capacity to deal with these problems. I certainly 
see, I can't tell you about the exact metrics of the, whether the, these fields are becoming more attractive. I do know that there's a lot of contextual variation. Uh, you know, and I, I know in some countries there's a huge demand for a few places for higher training. In other countries, they they go unfilled. Um, but what I will say is, among those who are training in psychiatry, psychology, um, there is a growing interest in population health, and this I is see. to be this is to be celebrated. And in part, this is because the the professional foundations uh, or the guilds are showing a stronger interest. So. It used to be the time that the primary goal of a practitioner and their guilds was individual patient care. But now there is a much broadening of the agenda. Just as a practical example, the American Psychological Association has made population health one of its most important flagship initiatives. And that would have been not something I could imagine happening even 10 years ago. So this, of course, gives inspiration and direction to the new generation of learners that you know, working around population health issues is something that is pleasurable, reward, it's rewarding, and could potentially have huge impact uh, uh, in life. And, and that's, that's to be celebrated. I think that is an upbeat note on which to end the conversation. So Vikram, thank you so much for your time and for your, your commitment to all of this stuff, uh, which is increasingly evidently important. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Philip. I've enjoyed this conversation.